Well, it is the Christmas season where the entirety of the world, for the most part, recognizes who Jesus is. A lot of people don't like to. They're desperately trying to change it, make it Saturnalia or something like that, and they're saying, well, you know, Christmas came from this, came from that. No, Christmas came from God. Why he chose the 25th, I don't know. Was Jesus born on the 25th? Probably not. Could have been, but not likely. But then again, God doesn't do things the way we would do them. If it were me, I would have had his birthday on his birthday. That's the way I would have done it. Now, God, on the other hand, he likes to make us all wonder. He likes to make us all look at him in awe. Because, you know, I hadn't really realized this before, but I was reading an article about Christmas, and, the, and it was by Joe DeCotch. And he said, you know, do something. Start counting backwards from Christmas. Go back nine months, and where do you come to? You come to September. That, well, could it be that Jesus, that God has had it so that we worship Jesus on his conception? Because he would have been conceived about this time of the year to be born in September. Which makes me wonder, you know, there's a big controversy, and this is just kind of a sidelight about when does life begin? You know, that's one of those things that you don't think about this kind of stuff. It just, there's little, you know, I've heard this before, way back when somebody mentioned it once, but it's like a giant jigsaw puzzle. We as Christians have a great teacher of the Holy Spirit, and he knows that it's very difficult to change a person's mind, to get us to believe the things that are true. Because as we talked about in past sermons, we are taught certain things throughout our lives from childhood that may or may not be true. And we just accept it. And then we build upon that. And so I was raised that um, Christmas was his birthday period. Then I came into a church that says, no, it's not his birthday. It's all pagan and all this and that and the other stuff, so we're not going to do it at all. Then the church changes and goes, well, we might have been wrong. And so here I'm sitting there, and all these years, many, many people have this battle in them. What do I believe? What is the truth? Was Jesus born on the 25th? Well, probably not. Could have been. We don't know. It's something that God has not let us know his exact day of birth. There's all kinds of things that we can go through in gyrations that will pretty much say, no, probably not. However, it shows that over here in September, at the end of the high days, he was probably born, most likely. So why did Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit put their stamp on Christmas? Why do it at the 25th? You know, all the gyrations, uh, well, it was pagan, it was this, it was the Roman emperor, it was all that. Well, so what if it was? It's just like the wedding ring. It was pagan to the core. But all Christian men and women wear wedding rings. See, the thing is, God doesn't take anything from paganism. Paganism takes things from God. God is the first cause of all things. So for us to say, well, God took something from paganism, that's really a slap in God's face. Because he didn't. He is the creator and ruler of all things. Now, today's sermon is about peace. Peace of mind, peace of heart. And this is another one of those sermons that blew me away. Because I knew what I was going to talk about. And then I sat down and I started to study. And God says, no, you're not. You're wrong. None of that is actually right. Because when we think of peace, we think of the physical peace of no war, no strife, 
No anger, no frustration, husband and wives loving each other, children doing what they're asked, peace, contentment, joy in our hearts, happiness, no stress, no strain, no anxiety. That's what we think of when we think of peace. So I decided to do what I always do. Okay, let's look at the words. Let's see what the word in the uh, Hebrew or the Greek or whatever actually meant. And does that meaning stand with the way we believe about peace? So you guys, you got Webster Dictionary. It says a lot about peace. Everything from the lack of war to inner tranquility, a total lack of inner bad feelings, and a physical well-being. Peace, contentment, gentleness, kindness, all the things that God tells us we should have. That's what we see as peace. So then I figured, okay, let's see. We know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and different languages, and the New Testament was written in Greek and Aramaic and other different languages. So let's see what the words mean there. It was really, really interesting. I went to my good old friend, Strong's Concordance, looked up the word peace. It's in there about 403 times in Scripture. Obviously very important to God. And so we're sitting there, and I'm looking at this, and something really struck me. In the Old Testament, probably about 300 of the words used as peace are almost all the same word. There's about four or five different words translated into peace. But the vast, vast majority is one word in the Hebrew. And it's used over and over and over again in many situations. And the interesting thing about this word is it means physical peace, physical well-being. That's what it means, the physical side of it. And you know what that word is? It's probably the only Hebrew word that every Christian knows. Shalom. And that word means peace. Physical peace. And that stands to reason. The old covenant was a physical covenant. Israel went to God, came to Israel and says, if you'll do this, I will do this. And it was physical things. So of course peace was a physical thing to them. Okay, now we come to the New Testament. The New Testament really befuddles us humans. Because the New Covenant is a totally and completely different kind of covenant. It has very little to do with the physical. It has everything to do with the spiritual. Now I'm not even going to try to pronounce the Greek word for peace that they translate into peace. But it's in there about a hundred times or so. And almost all of them are translated from this one word that is used. And its meaning is... Let me find it here. I lost myself just a second. Okay, the Greek definition. It's a prime root of a word, is a verb meaning to join. Peace, literally or figuratively, by implication, prosperity, one peace, quietness, rest, underpinned by set at one again. Do we understand what that means? I think you do. You've all been Christian for a long time. You've all felt the oneness of God in your heart. Can I ask you guys a question? How many of you in this room, you don't have to answer it, but think in your mind, do you ever consider that you won't live forever with God? Does that ever cross your mind? Do you ever think that God's gonna whack me for something? I mean, we know that God loves us, always loved us. He's always held on to us. He never has let us go. That's peace. We have a peace in our heart. And there's a young man, old man, that I pray for almost every day. And in that prayer, it's always mentioned that his name is in the book of life. And he doesn't have to worry about that. It's for sure. It's 100%. There's nothing he can do and take that away. Jesus came to earth all those years ago to bring peace. But it's not the physical peace that we think of. It's a spiritual peace to make us one with God again. You know, we've never been separated from God. God has always been here. Now, I have separated myself from God at one time. I've told God to go away and don't leave me, but he won't. He's always there and always has been and always will be. We cannot get away from God. 
We can ignore him. We can ask him to go away. We can avoid him. But he's always there. And that's something that Satan doesn't want you to know. So when Jesus came all those years ago, he came to bring peace to our hearts and our souls to make us one with the Father again. Not so much that Jesus to us or God to us, but us to God. For us to be able to say, I truly love my Father. I am a child of the Most High God. I live for Him. I do these things because this is what I want to do. I am part of the God family. I live in a physical world, but my kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. How does this translate to the way our lives should look? When you have that kind of love and you key in on it and you understand it and you believe it and you live it, you no longer have competitions in your life for anything. You don't look to human beings for recognition for anything. You don't yearn and desire that. You know, God gives us examples of what happens to Christians. In this case, it's an old guy in the Old Testament. Uh, it's uh, Mordecai, Haman, and Esther. Does everybody know the story of Esther? That's where the Haman had stirred up the king and he was going to kill all the Jews. And so Mordecai got his, I guess, granddaughter or not daughter or whoever in there and she marries the king. And then so she has the ear and Mordecai is doing nothing but trying to save his people. He's not trying to get any recognition for himself or nothing. He's just trying to save his people. And of course, in the end, what happens? God works through these people, saves his people. But he doesn't stop there. Everything that Haman have, God gives it to Mordecai. He paraded him through the streets, says, this is my servant. This man did my job, and, and he gave him great honor. But God gave that to him. God was the one that did that. So many of us run around trying to get people to say us how wonderful we are and what we've done. And if we have that peace of God, all we want is an attaboy from God. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want. And that's why it's so important that we as Christians, when we see another brother or sister doing something good, that we tell them, hey, that was a good thing to do. Thank you. God works through us. I doubt that we'll see a Haman, Esther type thing in our world. But as Christians, when you see another Christian or anybody doing a good thing, we need to let them know, hey, God saw that. That was a good thing. Thank you. And it's not recognition that they've actually desired, but as human beings, we need it. We need to know God is watching. And God watches through us. He watches what we do. We watch what each other does. We have to have examples. You know, um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God says, my grace is enough for you. You know, we spend a lot of time worrying about our physical stuff. But really, we don't have anything to worry about. Not really. God says, hey, I take care of the flowers. I feed the birds. Aren't you more important than they? He promises to take care of us. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen. People say, yeah, but I don't, can't see how anything's going to happen. Well... What do we do about worry? Worry comes from not doing anything. Just sitting around thinking nothing can happen, we're not going to get this, it's not going to happen. You know, we deal with a lot of homeless people in our congregation. And most of them aren't homeless on purpose. Stuff has happened. You know, things got out of control. And what does Rick and Eileen and everybody do back here? 
They love on them until they go, hey, you know what? I really don't want to be living homeless anymore. And then they sit down and they start making a plan. All right, so what do you want? Okay, these are all the things that are available to you. And I guarantee you, if you pick one and get started, you'll feel better about yourself. Oh, I don't have an address. Nobody will take my applications. Well, you can use the church's address. We can spring for an address at the UPS store or blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, but I got to be clean. Well, we got showers. All you got to do is come and take your shower. But I don't have any good clothes. Well, hey, we got some money. We got used clothing. We can help you with that. Peace of heart and peace of mind coming from understanding, come from believing, and it comes from hard work. We have to work on our relationship with God. We have to come to church. We have to sit down with believers everywhere and talk about God. We have to see God's hand in everything. We have to look at our new president and say, he is what he is. May God bless him, that he will make decisions that will make it so we can continue to preach the gospel throughout the world. We have to support him just like we supported President Obama. And guess what? With all Mr. Obama's faults, we're preaching the gospel stronger than we ever have. And it turns out that Mr. Obama was a pretty decent president overall as presidents go. But so many people thought he was just going to destroy this country. Oh, he's a Muslim. No, he's not. He's a Christian to his core. His administration has been more Christian than any that I can think of in forever. There been no scandals. He and his wife are very much in love. They've worked hard to raise their children. What more can you ask from a president? But Jesus, he came 2,000 years ago to instill the peace of heart and mind that only comes from being part of God. See, it doesn't matter what happens to us in this world because we know we have a future. Like was said in a sermon ago about hope. He is hope. Period. It's not human hope that, oh, maybe something's going to happen. It's finished, 100%, sure. And there's nothing in the universe, or not God himself, will even try to change that. And it all comes down to do we truly, truly love the Father? Because when we love that way, nothing else matters. Everything we want to do is to please him. And boy, I tell you what, when your heart and mind and soul and everything starts to change and you're not running around being mad at everybody or trying to become the best of everything and try to get everything for yourself, life really changes. You start to have time to enjoy that peace. Oh, look at that bee over there on that flower. Oh, stay away from me, bee. I'm allergic to you. <laughs> but there's a peace that comes from knowing who God really is, to knowing that he really does exist, knowing that his son really came to earth, that he really did get born of a woman. He really was fully God and fully human. He really did be tempted by everything that you're tempted by. There's nothing that you get tempted by that he wasn't tempted by. And yet he had peace. His entire life was one of peace. Even when he was upset with somebody, it was peaceful. When he turned over the money changers, that was for effect. He was making a statement. Look, guys, this is the house of the Most High God. You shouldn't be in here selling stuff. That should be done outside. This is a house of worship only. Jesus was the most peaceable man that ever walked on the face of the earth. Even when he was on the cross, he was at peace. Even when they were ramming nails in his hands, he was at peace. Because he was one with the Father. He was one with the Holy Spirit. And he knew that by his coming and living through that, all of us 
would again become one with the Father. And that is true peace. So that word that we were talking about earlier, it means at one. It's that part of peace, to become at one with, is what that word means. So the vast majority of scriptures in the New Testament can be read like this. Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the ones who make people at one. Peacemakers. Luke 1, 79. Guide us to be peacemakers. Guide us to be at one. At one goodwill towards men. At one with God. At one with each other. At one with the world. At one with your pets. Faith made the whole world go into at one minute. Peace. At one minute with God. Peace with God. Peace is being at one with God. So as we read through the New Testament, there's over a hundred and some odd scriptures in there that talk about being at one with God. But for a vast punch of, of, uh, of Christianity, they, they look at it, and I did, as a physical kind of a peace he was bringing to the world. But it's not a physical peace. It's a spiritual peace. And all of our life can be that peace because that peace says, I am your daddy. I will take care of you. You do not have to worry about anything. Just be my child and go around helping people to be at one with me. John 14, 27, my at one moment I give. And all of these are just plucks out of a lot of scriptures that are talking about a lot of different things. But when you're reading scripture and you're reading along, you see that word peace. Remember, this is new covenant. This is a spiritual covenant. This is your eternity. And to live with God forever, you have to be spiritual. Your body has to become spiritual. Your soul has to become spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit in you. And that only comes by being at one with the Father. You know, Rick was talking about the three circles. and the, Well, that circle also has a giant circle with us all on it. We're all part of that. You, you, all of you. You're all part of the family of the Most High God, the creator, the owner, the builder of all things. And if scripture, if I understand scripture right, one of these days he's going to come and all physical things will be gone and everything will be made out of spirit. The entire universe, the earth, everything. It's interesting to note that in the Old Testament, they talk about this guy named Melchizedek. And it's interesting, if you look up that scripture, it talks about him being the king of Salem. You know what Salem means? Rock. It means rock. And then if you go through all the changes, a little bit of changes through the words, you know how words are a little bit different for this, a little bit different for that, it gets down to peace. That's where we get the king of peace from. And it's interesting that when you go into the New Testament and they talk about it in Hebrews, he's the Prince of Peace, Melchizedek. And we know that Melchizedek is of the God family because he has no beginning and no end. And so we all sit around and we're pretty sure that that was Jesus as the high priest of everything. And he was the one that Abraham tithed to. And I suspect he's probably the one that told Abraham to leave his family and go to the land of wherever and do all the things that he did. So it's interesting that Jesus, when he came to earth, he wasn't only Lord and Savior, he was also the high priest. 
of everybody and everything. And through that high priest came peace. Just like in the olden days in the old covenant, Abraham went to him for peace because he was the king, prince of peace. And all this stuff wraps together to come to that moment of conception when Jesus became Jesus. Before that, he was Melchizedek. He was the God of the Old Testament. He was Yahweh. He was the creator of all things. He was, you know, all this stuff. But all that time, doing all that stuff, he knew that he was also the Prince of Peace. That he was going to come and bring us all back to the Father. He was going to open our minds and we can realize that, wow, God really does love me. God has always loved me. I have never been alone. I have him in my heart and I am coming back to him. Old Snakey's not going to get me. He's not. We're not going to allow it. No. Jesus is not going to allow it. The Father calls us. He says, I want you back. I want a relationship with you again. I don't want to just be there. I want to be part of it. And as he calls us back, we come. But we're not after physical peace. It's wonderful, and God does give that to us. But it's spiritual peace that we're after. It's that peace of mind knowing that what you know is true. No wondering, no guessing, no considering that, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe God really doesn't exist. There's none of that. Because the Prince of Peace came and showed us that it is true. Jesus is the Prince. He is the King. He is the way to the Father. And as we go about our lives, we need to live that. People need to hear us saying it. Don't be afraid. There's a lot of ways to say it that can be gentle and kind. And the Holy Spirit will show you what to say. You know, the scripture says that you're going to be drugged before princes and kings and all this, but don't worry about what you're going to say. The Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. We don't ever have to worry about it or really think about it too much. Because you're, you will, if you believe that you are the child of the Most High God, Say what you need. So this time of the year, as we sing carols, as we give gifts, as we sit in front of the trees and observe all the beauty around, remember that the Prince of Peace is the reason for all of this. And if somebody wants to tell you, well, it's all pagan, I'm not going to do it. Well, guess what? They need to study into it and find out because it's not. It's not pagan at all. Because none of the pagan days actually were on the 25th. They were all around it. This is the day that God set for us to remember the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Hope, the Prince of Love, the Prince of Caring. So, as God took Mordecai and showed him off to the world as somebody that did his will and loved him, he's going to do the same for all of us. The day is going to come when he's going to take you, march you through the streets and say, this is my son, this is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. Will we ever be perfect? Yes. That day when our soul and our body are made spirit. From that time forward, we will be perfect. Are you perfect in the Father's eyes? Yes. Because he will not see anything but what we're going to become. Why? Because he loves you. 
and he wants a relationship with you. And thankfully, our Father will have what he wants. It's assured. It's 100%. So, if somebody says he wasn't born on this day, just simply say, well, count backwards. It's that simple. This is the time when we celebrate the birth of the Lord God Most High. The one who came here and suffered everything we suffered, understands everything that could possibly be understood, and he showed us the only way to live a sinless life is to have the Spirit of God fully. Because that's what he had. He was fully God and fully human, and the fully human side never had a chance. Because the Spirit of God is stronger than anything on this planet. So as we go, remember, peace in the new covenant means to be one with God. If you want peace, then you should want to be one with God. And to be one with God is you have to understand that he loved you. And he loved you first. That's why you can love him. He proved it by giving his only son, the Prince of Peace, to die for us. So, as you go about this, this season, think about it. Think about the Sermon on Hope. He's our hope. Sure, 100%. Not human hope, God hope. God hope is 100%. Peace. God peace is 100%. If you don't have it, ask for it. You will be given it. Because that is one prayer that God wants to answer. And he will. So, enjoy the Christmas. Have a good time. Eat too much. Do all the things that we, we do at Christmas. <laughs> Celebrate before the Lord. Be happy. Be kind. Be gentle. And when people are down or they're upset, just simply say to them, look, God loves you. He loves you with all of his heart, mind, and soul. He loves you so much. He gave you his only son so that you could have peace with him. And then just turn around and walk away. And just let him think. Because what you're doing is this giant jigsaw puzzle God's working with and you're putting in pieces. And as it goes, all of a sudden you get towards the filling in. Jigsaw puzzles go really fast when you get to a few pieces left. Bang, 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 bang. There it is. And a light will go on. And down in eternity somewhere, you'll be looking at people's poses. Oh, that was, I put that piece there, and I put that piece there, and I put that piece there. Well, God did through you. But don't think you don't affect lives. Positive, to the point, this is what I believe, statements go a long way with people.